So, welcome to our first class. Uh, today is going to be pretty easy. We're going to go over uh, the syllabus a little bit and uh, talk about what we're going to do in the class, what you all should be uh, ready for. And Jill is going to give you all a primer on uh, some of the stuff we're going to do in the next two weeks, like using a pipette and using a scale and how to do those things. So be ready. Um, Jill will help us out throughout the course. So she's going to be one of the other teachers. So if you have any questions and you can't get a hold of me, feel free to seek out Jill. Um, she's pretty smart, and I'm sure she can help you out also. All right. So, we should add. You have it. E S T E A S T E R D A Y. Is that how you spell it? No, that? E A S T E R D A Y. So if you want to open up the syllabus, feel free to open it up. Otherwise, I'll just uh, go along with it. So this class is going to be a combination of theoretical knowledge and experimental knowledge. Um, because we're assuming that you all have no knowledge in this. And even if you do have some knowledge in uh, you know, molecular biology, genetic engineering, and those things... I suggest you still, you know, follow along so that you're able to brush up on the knowledge and skills. A lot of times we think we know stuff and we don't actually know it as well as we thought we did. So, you know, uh, pretend like you don't know anything and start from scratch while, while, while you're doing this class and uh, hopefully you can pick up a lot of different things. So the goal of this class there's four different things we're going to try to learn about. We're going to try to learn about cells and DNA and RNA, protein, and genetic engineering. Those four things are the main concepts we're going to look at because those concepts are pretty much uh, the concepts you need to know if you want to do genetic engineering, molecular biology in the world today. Um, and, and some of them you can have a little bit less knowledge. Uh, for this class, obviously, it's two months. It's going to be fast. There's going to be a lot thrown at you. What I suggest is just try to consume as much as you can. Um, don't feel like you have to consume everything. Read every paper, read every chapter and every page of the book, and do every experiment. Just try to do as much as you can because... These things obviously take time to learn, and you can't just learn it, you know, in two months or, you know, whatever. Two months will give you a, a great foundation that you can then go on to explore lots of things. But, you know, like, if you want to actually be really good at this, it's, it's going to take a little bit more time, and, and that's okay. It's just constantly subjecting yourself to the information, right? Constantly putting it in front of you, constantly being involved with it, constantly talking with people. I, I recommend that, uh, you know, you, you go on social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, find, find us and interact with the people that we interact with. Um, you know, get involved in a community. If you have a local biohacker space, get involved in the community and just constantly be around this stuff so that you can grow as a scientist. Um, because that's the goal is to you know, uh, have everybody be scientists. <clears throat> so like I said, the goal is to take you from absolutely no knowledge, we're just pretending whether you, that you have no knowledge, whether you do or not, and go all the way to doing CRISPR experiments and genetic engineering experiments. Now, the book we're going to use is Molecular Biology of the Cell. And you could download a free copy. You can find that. Uh, on Google Drive. It should be on the classroom and everything like that. Download the book. Now, uh, it's a lot to read, right? So uh, be prepared. It's, it's going to be a lot. Um, 
but like I said, just try to read as much as you can. Even if you only read, you know, a few pages every week, just read something so you have some basal knowledge that you could then apply in the future. It's just constantly doing that, reading just a few pages, a few pages, and eventually over time that builds up and it turns into hundreds and thousands of pages, right? Um, we're going to use a couple pieces of, of software um, a little bit later in the course. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to download them to use, or use them now, but they are Snap, Gene, and VMD. So uh, when you get a chance, download those. Uh, I don't know exactly what week we will start using them in, but it's, it's probably not for a few weeks. So don't worry too much about that right now. So if you are missing anything um, or you end up missing something or losing something or breaking something during the course of the class, just contact us and we'll help figure out how to get it to you. We'll, we'll make it right. We'll fix it up for you so that you can continue with the class. Our goal is to help you to be able to learn these things and do these experiments because once you become a good scientist, uh, you're going to buy all your stuff from us, right? I hope so. Um, so if you, if you scroll down to the bottom of the syllabus, it, it gives you a list of the chapters in uh, molecular biology of the cell that you should read um, during different time periods of the class. Um, again, you know, it, I know it's going to be hard to read these things and put in the hours to get it done. If you can, like, that's awesome. If you can't, don't, you know, don't, don't be pissed off at yourself and uh, don't be mad at yourself or anything like that. Um, you know, just do your best. That's what this is about, right? Uh, you're not going to become a, a genetic engineer or bioengineer in one day. It's going to take a little bit of time. So just do your best with everything you can. Now, part of the course that is uh, interesting that we're, we're trying to do is we're trying to get you to read scientific papers. Um, experience reading scientific papers is really important because if you plan on sticking with this stuff and doing it more, you're going to have to read scientific papers. Um, doesn't matter if you like it or not. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. Scientific papers are boring as shit and and they're hard to read like even for me sometimes i have to read a scientific paper 10 times that's you know in my field that i got my phd in so don't feel bad if uh you read a scientific paper and don't understand it that much or or can't figure out what it is what i suggest is you read scientific papers and as you go through go through slowly and just like Look up some of the words and things that you might not know or understand, right? You're talking when you're learning uh, genetic engineering and biology, you're learning a whole new language. You're learning all these different words and things that mean something, and you need to l figure out what they all mean. So just go through and look up all the definitions of words that you don't know. Like, that is a huge start. That'll get you so far, and you could also impress your friends. When, when you talk about the difference between pluripotent and totipotent stem cells or something like that, right? Impress your friends when you're going out for a beer. That's, that's what I do. All right. Yeah, so we divide the experiments up into weeks, but don't feel like you can't skip a week and remake up the experiments. Some of the experiments for some weeks might be pretty short, and just take you like uh, an hour or two or something like that. And others might take much longer. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to start some experiments and stop them. Usually there's a lot of stopping points in experiments uh, so that uh, you don't have to do it all at once. So you can, you know, say make some plates on a Wednesday night and then do the experiments on Saturday. Um, that's what I, I would suggest is, you know, uh, just doing it, doing a little bit at a time. Uh, don't overwhelm yourself. Don't try to do everything at once. Uh, you know, read through the protocols. I think somebody was mentioning how, uh, you know, they need to read through the protocols a little bit more carefully. 
Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, read through it and ask questions. You know, that's what the class, the Google Classroom is for. Um, feel free to, uh, you know, ask us questions. Ask whatever you need. We're here for you all to learn. So ask us questions. Constantly ask questions. When we have these live classes, it's the perfect opportunity to ask questions. Um, because we are going to be be here to answer your questions, right? So uh, let me see. Do we got anything else we need to uh, go over, describe, and explain? Um, I think that should be ab about it. Um, if you have uh, <coughs> any questions about the syllabus or anything like that, uh, feel free to, again, ask, and we'll, we'll figure it out. So week one and two, we are going to focus on cell biology and learning some basic lab techniques. Now, some of these things, they're marked as assignments. That was just an accident. You don't have to turn anything, <laughs> turn, turn these things in. Um, but I appreciate people who are turning them in. You know, that's, that's great. Um, it means a lot to me. <laughs> but don't worry about turning them in. Just make sure you read them uh, and, and go over them and, and figure out what's going on. So each week we should have like, or every, you know, week or two we have these read me firsts. So make sure you obviously read those first. They'll give you an idea of what's going on, what you should know, what you should be prepared for, what papers you should read, and stuff like that. <laughs> so this week, um, we're going to learn how to use pipette and scale and uh, make plates and, and sterile technique in the, in the next two weeks. Um, do some cultures and, uh, you know, just learn how to work with basic molecular biology lab supplies. And make sure you, you do this stuff thoroughly. While pipetting might seem simple and easy and uh, people underestimate it, it's probably the largest place where people make errors. Professionals and people just starting alike. Like, you make errors doing pipetting, not paying attention to your pipetting, um, not being good at pipetting. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that 100% you know how to pipette and 100% you're always looking at it, focusing on it, make, making sure you're doing it correctly, right? Because like if you add the wrong amount of liquid or, or solution to your to your experiment, like, obviously it's going to go wrong. If your equipment's not working, obviously it's going to go wrong. So you need to make sure your equipment and, and you are using it correctly first before anything happens, right? So make sure you go over that pipetting protocol experiment a bunch of times, and Jill's going to show you in a little bit how to use some pipettes. So... Um, over the next two weeks, we have two papers, and uh, they're both related to cell biology. One is on how to create embryonic stem cells, which is a really cool paper, and it just discusses a little bit about uh, genetic engineering and how you can genetically modify an adult cell and turn it into a, a pluripotent stem cell. Pretty pretty cool. Um, it's something that hopefully will capture your imagination. And the other paper is about uh, the creation of a bacterial cell where the whole genome was made using a DNA synthesis rather than coming from another bacteria. So that was a pretty epic paper when it came out, and uh, people were really impressed. Now they're trying to make uh, synthetic genomes for yeast and even humans, hopefully in the next few years. 
So, uh, you know, things are moving along with that stuff, but it's, it's really interesting just to try to imagine what, um, what we can do and what can happen, right? All right. So uh, there are a few things that you need to remember when we're talking about cells, right? The first is that as far as we as humans have figured out, cells only come from other cells. Now, there's been some work by people to try to create synthetic cells, cells from scratch, and all this other stuff. But cells, all the cells that we know came from other cells, um, which, uh, you know, for me, every time I, I think about it and talk about it, it kind of blows my mind, right? That, like, that's all we know is cells from other cells. We we don't know cells that have been made from scratch. I, I thought we were a lot further along technologically. But, um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's pretty cool, though, right? Because cells are self-replicating, um, self-replicating matter. So when you genetically engineer cells, what you're basically doing is you're genetically modifying self-replicating matter, right? They can grow into stuff and, and build stuff and create stuff. So uh, it's something that is pretty cool, at least to me. Um, so... Uh, cells come in all different shapes and sizes. So when you're talking, when people are talking about cells, it's, it's very, like, you need to know what type of cell people are talking about, right? Bacterial cells can be, and usually are, extremely tiny, right? And <coughs> are generally hard to see under, uh, a, a light microscope or just like, you know, a normal microscope that people would use every day. Uh, yeast are a little bit bigger. Plant cells have different cell walls and different organelles, right? Mam human cells and mammalian cells are, are really big, bigger than both yeast and bacterial cells and different than plant cells also. Right. So when you're thinking about genetically modifying an organism, the type of cell matters. Right. It's going to be a lot easier to genetically modify a cell like a bacterial cell um, because its cell walls are more permeable. You can get stuff in easier, whereas a plant cell, you know, that has uh, what is it like lignin and cellulose around the outside it's a lot more difficult to get stuff inside the cell. Um, so they use techniques like gene gun or uh, agrobacterium to get DNA inside the cell. Plants are a little bit harder to genetically modify, but not, not definitely not uh, impossible with a, a, a DIY method um, or somebody in a home lab. It's something that uh you know you can learn with practice and over time all right so all living cells i i always get so viruses are virions i don't think they're cells they, they exist in a capsid right they don't consider virus capsids cells All cells, I have written down all cells of DNA and replicate their DNA in the same way. And I don't know if that's true. And I'm trying to, you know, prove myself wrong. But I can't think of any anything at the moment. Um, but yeah, so all organisms that are living, so excludes viruses, technically let's not count those as living right now, have DNA and uh, they replicate their DNA and replicating the DNA is how they replicate themselves, right? And the DNA is what they use to become alive. So 
DNA, as they always tell us, is the building block of life. I don't know what that means. <laughs> don't, don't ask me. Um, but it sounds important. It sounds very important. Um, so DNA isn't the, actually the thing that does anything, though. Right? So we always talk about DNA and how awesome DNA is and what DNA does and all these things, but it's not actually DNA that does anything. The DNA is turned into RNA and then is turned into proteins. And proteins are the important part in cells. They are what make cells, you know, alive, so to speak. They're literally like these little nano machines that can move around and do stuff. So like the way you move your muscles, the reason your heart beats, the reason that, you, you know, your brain works, it's all because of proteins. So proteins are, are probably more the building block of life than DNA, I guess. But proteins are the important thing. So when you're trying to genetically engineer something, you're trying to put DNA in the organism, but the only reason you're trying to put DNA in there is because you want to make some protein usually. Sometimes you want to make RNA or something like that. Um, but generally, let's just say, you know, for most cases, you're going to want to make protein. What does that protein do? Maybe that protein replaces a disease gene, right? So in like cystic fibrosis, there's a mutation in the gene. Maybe you want to replace that gene. So you have DNA make that protein. And, you know, muscular dystrophy, you have the dystrophin gene and things that are messed up. And so maybe you just want to put in a new copy of that gene to make it, it, it function better. Or maybe you want to add in some new genes that do something completely different, right? So, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to put in these genes to make new proteins to make cool things. Or maybe not cool things. I don't know. Maybe you're really boring. Um, diatoms? Oh, man. Ted. Ted's really trying to throw out the tough questions early. How do diatoms uh, replicate? <laughs> Diatom reproduction. All right, here we go. Let's see. Oh, no, they diatoms reproduce by binary fission. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's this similar to, like, bacteria, um, things like that. <laughs> so... All right, so proteins, we're going to learn about proteins. Um, understand that like the amount of DNA in an organism isn't related to its complexity. So genome size is not re related to the sophistication of an organism. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in that because you could be like, well, most bacteria have tiny genomes and humans have big genomes. But despite that easy to pick out numbers, like plants will have way more, uh, way larger genome sizes than humans. And uh, I think if you look at the list of genome sizes, there's a lot of cases where there's a, you know, non-animal that has genome sizes bigger than animals. So, you know, uh, don't get caught up too much in genome size and and genes and things like that. Um, it, it's DNA is important only in the fact that, let's say, it makes proteins pretty much. There's a lot of other stuff in DNA that's useful, but generally the important part of DNA is the protein making and what those proteins do, um, whether they turn you into a plant or a human. <laughs> um, I think we might have a paper when we get to the DNA section that talks a little bit more about this, but, um, you know, uh, model organisms are bullshit. So when you hear about people trying to use mice 
but you know, to test stuff for humans or things like that. You have to understand, even though the DNA might be just a little bit different, it can cause huge differences in terms of immunology, metabolism, all these things. When people say that they made like a Drosophila fruit fly live longer and uh, they try to relate it to humans, don't believe them. Don't trust them at all. Whenever anybody does an experiment in mice or not in humans and says it's related to humans, don't trust them. Immediately think they're skeptical, right? Immediately be skeptical of them, I mean. Hey, Brandon, what's up? So even though DNAs might be slightly different or be similar in size and all this stuff, they're not the same. Be skeptical, right? That's the, one of the best qualities of a scientist. Be skeptical. Not about everything, but, uh, you know, try to be skeptical about, you know, things that aren't, or people are trying to extrapolate, right? Especially when they're trying to extrapolate medical data or some cool thing from mice or worms into humans. Now, when you think of DNA and you think of proteins and you think of all these things, now basically what they are is they're just little molecules and a molecule is just composed of atoms. And what does an atom look like? I don't know, a cloud of electrons or something? Like we don't really look at atoms. Uh, so it's, it's something that you can't really visualize. But, you know, they're representations and things we do to visualize these things. So these molecules of DNA are physical objects, but they're so microscopic that, uh, you know, it's hard for us to conceptualize them. But these things are composed mostly of just five different things, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. There's some other stuff like sulfur and things thrown in there, but generally... These five atoms make up the large majority of things in cells. So if you want to grow cells of any type, whether it's yeast or bacteria or plants or human cells, basically, if you provide them with these five things, there's a good chance they're going to grow or, you know, at least survive in some way. So when you're growing your cells, when you're growing things on agar plates, when you're growing things in media or whatever, understand that these media is basically that's all it is. You're feeding these organisms sugar and some phosphorus and some nitrogen. And that's pretty much it, right? So the main component of a lot of these medias is things like yeast extract. And yeast extract is exactly like it sounds. Is basically just some yeast that everything has been extracted from them and provided to you so that you can, uh, you know, you can use all the, the good parts of the yeast that kept them alive for your organism, right? <laughs> all right. Okay, so everybody following along, everybody get this, everybody have an idea what's going on, pretty good. No, Ted, you have no idea what's going on? No, we're talking about links. Oh, don't worry about that. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Questions, questions. Jill, don't. <laughs> Is linked to info on making my own gene gun. Come on, what do you got? <laughs> what do you got? Somebody, somebody's got a question. <laughs> huh. 
how's my myostatin going? Um, it's not something I'm, I'm working on. It's not something I'm, I'm trying to get. I, I don't really inject myself with stuff anymore. Sorry, Ted. I hope I didn't disappoint you. <laughs> Brandon, you could find a copy of this live stream uh, right here on YouTube. If you click on the Odin and go to the channel, there should be a playlist that has this live stream. <laughs> Yes, Trey, that's a good question. Are proteins what determine the cell-specific function? Exactly, right? So the different proteins in a cell will determine how specifically that cell functions. So if you start, let's say we start with like a stem cell, you know, totipotent stem cell in an embryo that can become anything, right? Then what happens is as this cell gets subjected to uh, other proteins or molecules, it starts to differentiate. And this differentiation causes different amount of proteins to be in the membrane, in the cytoplasm. It, it causes the shape of the cell to start to differentiate. And basically, the proteins, all, all cells generally will have the same genes, but the proteins inside the cell and the proteins that are regulating those genes will determine the cell specific function. H.B. Waller, how do papers on model organisms pass through if they're bullshit? Who are they convincing? Well, it, so you have to understand that when people are just publishing something, they're just publishing a paper, right? So generally, they're not making grandiose claims. It's usually when the media gets a hold of it and they, they see this paper that they like cured cancer. I mean, like they've cured cancer in mice at least 10,000 times, right? They've cured every type of cancer in mice. So it's not necessarily that the papers are bullshit. It's that the way they're portrayed is bullshit, right? It's when scientists look at the paper, generally you they look at it with, with skepticism. They understand the mechanism and the function behind this. Um, <laughs> but they, they understand the limits of it. A lot of people don't understand the limits of how, um, how a, a mice relates to a human or how a fruit fly relates to a human. They think that these things can just be interchanged, but they really can't, right? Mr. Metric... In this class, and one, do you teach enough info to make bacteria manufacture custom proteins? Something other than GFP. Uh, I mean, you can use the knowledge from this class to make bacteria make custom proteins, but we don't go through um, exactly how to do that, right? Like, all you have to do is take a, a plasmid you want and put it in bacteria or yeast the same way you learned in the class, but we don't teach you how to manufacture that custom plasmid. In the 102 class, it's, it's way more in-depth and it requires other equipment like centrifuge and things like that. So in the 102 class, we go over that stuff. But in 101, we're just teaching you how to uh, how all, all this works, right? So how to actually uh, genetically modify the organisms. Like there, there's plenty of information you'll learn that in this class that putting in more is uh, will be overkill. <laughs> Does epigenetics play a role in the expression of genes? Ted, yes, it does. Um, what way, how, and, and what? That's complicated and not exactly understood, but uh, some people say certain epigenetic things silence genes, but not all genes that have different epigenetic markers are silenced or have different expression levels. Um, it's complicated. Epigenetics is kind of still magic. How does one cell become a toenail and the cell right next to it become flesh? Oh, so this Dixon's is like cell. This is developmental biology it gets into. And basically, it's this complex symphony, I guess, so to speak, of cells in proximity to each other, interacting with each other and secreting certain molecules and factors uh, that tell each other what to become, Right. So you can imagine if, say, you were a tile on the floor 
and you had instructions that said if three how many are there there's one two three four five six seven eight eight so if you have a, a three by three grid of of tiles and you're the one in the center if you have say five of the other tiles that are a certain cell type it says well you know you should become that cell type right something like that that's not exactly how it happens obviously it's more complicated than that it depends on the tissue and all these other things and i don't even know how every tissue becomes everything but if you want to look up developmental biology and look up the way these things go they have it pretty well mapped out in some model organisms like drosophila and c elegans <laughs> Is there a better way to go than animal models and strip trying something in humans? Um, not necessarily, but I think we right now um, fail to use larger mammals. You know, we, 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 should, we should be using more larger mammals in our research or, or animals that are more close to humans. The thing is that things start to get really into ethics and ethical and expensive and what it costs to keep these animals and work with these animals and use these animals. So science is this um, fancy dance between how much money you want to spend, how much we know about that particular organism, and how much effort you want to put in, right? So if you're using an, a large mammal, say like a dog or a pig or a horse or a goat or something like that, uh, generally there's a lot less information than you'd find in, say, mice, right? So what that does is it forces people to, you know, repeat the cycle and constantly use mice because mice is where all the information is. Um, meta so, you know, Ted, there's not much difference between metabolic pathway editing and gene editing. Metabolic pathway editing is just a, a fancy phrase people use to try to, you know, get more money for their companies. But all metabolic pathway editing is, is say, putting in more than one gene that would function together synergistically to make something happen inside a cell, right? So it's, it's, it's generally not any more or less complicated. Now, if you want to devise novel metabolic pathways, that can start to get complicated. Or if you want to take a pathway from another organism and, you know, make, say, THC and bacteria or something, that could be a little complicated. But generally, metabolic, uh, metabolic pathways... Uh, you know, they can be pretty straightforward or as complicated as you want, depending on how complex you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, Sebastian, it really depends what type of cell you're trying to work with and uh, what type of, you know, thing you're trying to get it moved towards. There are plenty of cells that move towards things. A lot of cells. I think one of the papers we might have in here is like using genetic engineering to cause human cells to move towards light, which is pretty cool. All right, any other questions before Jill? I don't know why I have these headphones on because there's like absolutely no sound. I guess y'all could probably hear me even without the headphones, right? Can, can everybody hear me? Can people hear me? Jill, can you? Yeah, looks like the mic's working. You can hear me. The transportation of CC9 or CC13, is there better vectors or viruses? Example, using a respiratory virus versus H1 to reach particular cells, cellular DNA types. <coughs> what do I prefer, genetic engineering or protein engineering? Okay, so Brandon, I, it, that I don't know anything about CC9 or CC13, so I'm not going to be able to tell you what the best vector is, and that depends on a lot, right? It depends on where it's trying to be transported to, what kind of protein it is, what it's doing. There's a lot of different things. So generally, you don't want to use different types of viruses, right? 
uh, unless you're talking about different AAV serotypes. Like, you don't just want to use, you're, you're never, no scientist is going to use a random respiratory virus to put a gene into a human body because these viruses have so many other things in them that could do bad things. Generally, you want to put a virus in your body that's non-replicative, -replica, so it doesn't replicate, because you can imagine if you start infecting yourself with repli replicating viruses, your immune system is going to freak out and uh, it's probably going to cause something bad. So generally people focus on AAV stereotypes, adeno-associated viruses. So you should look into those and see if people have used any of those. The Sudarshan, what do I prefer, genetic engineering or protein engineering? Ugh, that's a tough one. Protein engineering is cool, but it, it generally is not as applied as genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is a lot more applied. So protein engineering is like uh, people who like to, uh, you know, I don't know, write program code or write code or something like that. And genetic engineering is like people who like to build robots. So they both can be pretty cool. But uh, so anyway, I'm going to go for now because Jill's going to take over. So you all be ready for Jill. She's going to show you how to do some pipetting and stuff. And we're going to switch. All right. Okay. Is it, is it just like frozen? It's still working? Oh, yeah. That's just pause. Okay. Because then it doesn't get feedback and stuff. If you want to... Okay. That's so it has a chat if you want to like look at the actual screen. Oh, it's like up here. Yeah, so that's it's a little lagged. Yeah, so, uh, it's like 10 seconds. Yeah, so. Just making sure I'm gonna. Yeah. Hit. Sorry, gonna... everyone. We're... Okay, it's good. It's about the right height, so that's good. Okay. Hi, Peter. How's it going? <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to um, be going over using our scales and our pipettes. <coughs> and first things first is safety. So if you have long hair, you are going to want to put it up because hair and food is gross and hair and plasma, plasmid is worse. <laughs> and then next, since we're doing science, we want to put on our gloves. And this will be pretty good for everything you're going to do. You don't really need um, eye protection or uh, a mask, but gloves are great. Okay, so either you already have or you are going to get a scale very much looking like this one. Um, pretty <coughs> basic, so we just press it on, takes a second, and you wanna make sure, we're, we, have, we do everything in grams, it has different units. Uh, it doesn't like it because I'm holding it up. And right now it's going crazy because I'm messing with it. But we have different units. Make sure it's on grams up top. And then basically what you're going to do is you're going to put your, this is all going to be on a nice stable table. You're going to put on your, um, your weigh boat and tear it. And when you do it on a table, when you press the tear button, it makes it zero so that uh, you don't have to subtract the weigh boat uh, mass from whatever you're weighing out. And so it'll be like, it'll be like that. And when you press tear, it'll be zero. And then you just get whatever you're measuring out. We gave you guys spoons. So that you can weigh out the proper amount. And oops, left my notes over here. 
And so that's pretty straightforward. Um, one note is that you want to kind of center as much as possible everything you're weighing for better accuracy. Uh, you want to bench your table that's as stable as possible, so heavier is better. Um, if at all possible, you want your work area free of vibrations or drafts, because that will also mess up um, your measurements. And then um, ours broke off, but you all have a nice little um, cover for your scales. And so when you're done, you just want to clean off any um, of the um, powders that you're weighing. If it fell, that's okay. You just want to clean it off afterwards before you close it to keep your scales in good shape. And um, so that's basically scales. Those are pretty easy. And then we have our pipettes. So you have or are getting uh, three different pipettes. I'm currently using the 100 to 1000 microliters. So you change, you still want to use your um, gloves always, and you change how much the pipette holds by moving, rotating the end part. So if I want, for example, 900 on this one, I'll just go like that and it's at 900. Then you're going to put on your tips. So we sent you three different sizes of tips for your three different sizes of pipettes. So when you put it on, you just make sure that it's on nice and firmly. Sometimes do a tap and bring it up. Then you're going to take your liquid that you are pipetting and you want to insert the tip uh, far enough down so that you'll make sure that you won't suck up any air bubbles, uh, but you don't want to stick it in as like as far as it can go because then you'll have a, a lot of liquid adhering to the outside and it could mess up your measurement. So you stick it in a good amount, and first you do um, three times where you suck up the liquid and then just put it back because that coats the inside of your pipette tip so that you don't lose any, um, you don't lose an amount of liquid the first time you're doing it. Um, also, right now I'm just using colored water, so it's coming up pretty quickly. However, what if you're using, um, if you're pipetting something thicker, you might want to wait and I generally like to count to uh, three if it's a thick liquid to make sure that it's had enough time to, um, to uptake all of the liquid. And you want to uptake and um, put out nice and smoothly. You don't want to like flick it or anything that's gonna mess up your measurement. Um, when you uptake, you pull, you go down, there's two stops on a pipette. There's this what's called the soft stop, which is where you feel slight pressure, but then you can push it down more. And the reason for that is you go to the soft stop to pull up your liquid and then when you go down to release your liquid, you go all the way to the, to the full stop. And then that makes sure that all the liquid that was in there is pushed out. It just pushes it out with some extra air. Um, you want to have the pipette go in at 90 degrees when you're taking up. However, when you are putting it back in, into an or putting it into another container. You want to slightly angle the container so that it doesn't splash and it goes in nice and, um, and evenly. Okay, let's see. Um, if your pipette 
is full, you do not want to lay it on its side because then it, the liquid can get into the, um, to the actual pipette and contaminate it, and that would be a pain to clean, so you definitely don't want to do that. If your pipette does get dirty, you can clean it with 70 to 90% ethanol, and uh, that'll help sterilize it so that you can use it again without contamination. Um, once a year, you want to calibrate your pipettes. Um, there, I believe there's instructions in there on how to do it. Basically, you're using the density of water and you have a scale and you like weigh out the volume to make sure that it's accurate. Um, and if you have more questions about that, go ahead and ask that in the Google Classroom and we can uh, go over that a bit more. Um, make sure your tips, we know that the tips we sent you um, will fit well. However, if you order more tips and they seem to be different, just one time check and make sure that it's not leaking or anything. You'll see it's pretty, pretty readily if you just wait and nothing comes out for like a minute or so, you're totally fine. Uh, but sometimes like I don't even like press down hard enough and they start to get drops down and I see it. So then I, um, then I just toss that pipette tip and get another tip. And then to get the tip off of your plunger, because it, um, this is just water, but maybe it's contaminated with something you don't want to touch. You basically press this part, and what it does is it, um, put it in my little way boat. It takes off the tip without, oops, that fell anyway, but yeah, it takes off the tip without you having to, uh, to touch the end so that you're as clean as possible. Uh, questions, where can I get ethanol? 